Oh, good to be with you. First service, it was fun because we had people, it was, it was almost like the, uh, it was like the multi-ethnic service, wasn't it? First service, we had people from Peru and Argentina and Panama, and they're part of our church family. And you didn't know where that, uh, but here's the thing, even with the, the, um, the universality of who we are as humans, we all are feeling some pain right now as, as a human race. You know, it's not just something we in North America are feeling. It's something that people all over the world are feeling, right? The universality of this pain and this suffering. And uh, boy, I was thinking to myself, there's, there's something even, even wonderfully um, remarkable in this shared experience that we can, we can share in this, this, these times and, and remain hopeful, remain focused. Like Howard's pointing us to the faithfulness of God. How good is that to be reminded of God's faithfulness that he is relentlessly with us and following us and pursuing us and that is awesome. But sometimes I think we can lose sight of even judging someone else's pain and difficulty and, and almost have a moral superiority. Has anyone ever dealt with the demon of moral superiority in their hearts? Just wondering. It's easy to do, isn't it? Just this week, Capital Wednesday, what a devastating scene that was. And, and, and not devastating that, you know, here's what we affirm. We affirm the right to peaceful protests. Amen? We affirm the right that we live in a cultural context, a governmental context that allows us to freely express, freely engage in conversation and debate and dialogue, as long as we keep it civil and decent. Amen? I love the fact that we are able to to agree to disagree without being disagreeable. But the moment you go from peaceful protest to rioting, I have a problem with that. Right? Violence doesn't accomplish anything. And so the moral superiority guy in me has been continually ce- celebrating over everyone who's, be- who's being arrested. How about you? Maybe this is one of the upsides of social media that maybe these guys are stupid enough to be like, hey, selfie! Who is that guy? And there's dozens and dozens and dozens of us, even right here in our own backyard. And it's easy to sit there and go, shame on you, idiots, jerks, right? And, and I do believe that they need to be punished. But it's easy to put yourself in a place and go, I'm better than them. Did you feel, did you feel any of that in your own hearts? Like, you know, for me, I... I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm just, and it creeps over into our spiritual lives too. Sometimes we can look at one another and be like, at least I'm better than so-and-so. And especially when something happens to somebody, sometimes we think like, I wonder if God's judging them. I wonder if they're suffering what they're suffering because God's punishing them. And, and if we keep our, our lives in, in the right lane and, and, and we're being all righteous and godly, then in our minds we think prosperity equals piety and sinfulness equals judgment. Because what happens to other people? Oh, they must be bad to, to deserve that. Has, has anyone ever felt that? Or is that just me? I'm just, this is just confession for me. And, and there's this really bad thinking that goes on around the world because we can also look at like natural calamities, like the, the plane that took off in Indonesia a couple days ago and crashed 60 people dead. You know, and we can look at that and we can evaluate it and we can ask ourselves in all these types of situations, like where is God? Because it brings us to the most human dilemma possible and that is the presence of pain and the existence of God. In, in theological circles, they call that theodicy. How do you reconcile a world that experiences pain and suffering in the existence of God? Because if God is powerful enough and doesn't do anything about the pain and suffering, he must be a capricious God. And if he's, if he's kind enough and loving enough and he doesn't do something, then he must be really an evil God. And so atheists have argued that simply because the presence of evil is here, there certainly can't be a God, which then backfires on the atheist, doesn't it? Because they're presuming they know what good and evil is. And even C.S. Lewis said, unless you know a stick is straight, how do you know what a crooked stick looks like? The problem of evil has been with us from the beginning, ever since the days of Job. Job is like the, the Bible's book given to us, the earliest book in the Bible, Job. First book ever written. And it deals with the problem of evil. 
and the presence of God. As if God said, everyone's going to struggle with this. And yet Job's friends were the worst counselors. I'm going to tell you right now that some of us have Job's friends in our lives. And they are nothing but communicators of bad theology. <laughs> right? The moment something bad happens is like, well, you better confess some sin because you wouldn't be going through what you're going through if you weren't a sinner or you didn't make some mistake, or you didn't make some poor choice, or whatever. That's not necessarily how God works. But Job's friends would argue the opposite. Job chapter 4, verse 7. Job, from one of his friends, remember who that was innocent ever perished. Meaning, the innocent don't die. Wrong. Or, where were the upright cut off? When you walk uprightly or righteously, certainly God won't do anything to you. Bad theology. Another friend, later on in chapter 8, says this, if your children have sinned against God, well, he's delivered them into the hand of their transgression. Meaning, Job, you know the reason why your kids are dead? Because he lost children. I mean, sad, right? All his friends can say is, well, obviously they were sinners and deserve what they got. Now, those of you who have kids, how would you like that kind of encouragement from a friend? If you lost a child, it, it doesn't help, does it? See, they're operating from a faulty premise that when you live righteously, you'll always prosper. Can I just tell you right now, even the godly and the committed go through painful times. John chapter 9. Even the, even the gospel where, you know, here's John, he, he cites this example because here's Jesus healing people and, and it says as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth Right, This man is never seen in his life and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Who can we put the blame on? Don't we tend to do that? Like we want to, we want to somehow excuse away like, well, God certainly didn't do that and certainly there's maybe some issues with the parents, right? So, so Jesus, who, they give Jesus like one of two and you never go to God with just two things like, hey, pick one. God's like, I'll pick a third. What does it say in John chapter 9, verse 3? Here's what Jesus says. This man has been born blind. Why? Chapter 9, verse 3, he says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. So just so you guys know, we're going to take the topic off of who sinned because that's not really the issue right now. The issue is that this man was born the way he was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Isn't that Awesome. God is going to be glorified. And that's all you need to know. Because here's what we don't do. We don't gain any ground by having abstract questions where we'll never get the answer. Classic, right? Well, you know, the moment we start talking about my heart is the moment I'm going to deflect that conversation. And let's talk about what God's doing in the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa among people I don't even know. Because I don't want to talk about me. Well, this morning I have a gift for you. We get to talk about you. <laughs> we get to talk about me. We get to look at this amazing passage where we get to understand perhaps a little bit, a little bit of glimpse into the, into the desire of God and in the, in the world we live in as, as, as painful and as, as difficult as may be, as, as the sufferings we experience. How can we make sense of, of what's going on around us? Because here's the, I mean, Isaiah 55, boy, I, I couldn't help but think of this passage. Isaiah 55, he says this, seek the Lord while he may be found. Here's, here's the key, and you're going to hear this more in a bit. The reason we experience the things we experience is that every single day, God wants you to find him. He wants you to discover him. He wants you to know him. He wants you to love him. He wants you to worship him. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man, his, his uh, thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him to our God. So it's this idea of returning, right? Because here's then the classic part of Isaiah 55 that we all know and, and, and appreciate. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. Neither are my ways your ways. For as the high, heavens are higher than the uh, earth, so my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. There are ways and means that God operates in this world that we will never understand. But the things that he has revealed to us, he wants us to embrace. And that's what we get to talk about in Luke 13. 
Turn your Bibles there, if you would. We're going to talk about two aspects of, of God's character, his, his attributes, that really are important when it comes to this topic of pain and suffering. And that is, number one, God's mercy, and number two, God's patience. And we're going to read this interesting account the only time it's found in the Gospels, the only place it's found in the Gospels is right here in Luke chapter 13. Look at verses 1 through 9. Some interesting events have taken place, and, and Jesus is going to address these events perhaps in a way that we weren't anticipating. And then he's going to summarize what he's been teaching in a parable, because parables are, are simple stories that even childish people or childlike people like me need to understand. Verse 1, chapter 13. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to Jesus about the Galileans who, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 people whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed uh, them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he began to tell them this parable. A certain man had a fig tree which had been planted in the vineyard, and he came to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any fruit on the fig tree. So he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Go ahead and cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground it is planted in? And he said to him, and he answered him and said, Let it alone, sir, for, for give me one more year, and I'll dig around it, and I'll put fertilizer on it. And, and if it bears fruit in the next year, great. But if not, go ahead and cut it down. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. So some interesting sections of scripture that are so, so important to navigate. The first section has to do with God's mercy and understanding our sufferings. And here's what we affirm. We affirm that, that God is too kind to be cruel and do too deep to ever explain himself to us. And yet we have this, this presentation to Jesus from these from these uh, leaders, from these Jewish people who came to Jesus, and they, uh, they just affirm a statement, almost as if they're looking for Jesus to agree with them. And, and here's the situation they present to Jesus. So it was a bummer that those Galileans died at the hands of Pilate the other day. Almost as if they're waiting for Jesus to say, yeah, that was a bummer. Because what they're implying in their statement is this, there's this group of Galileans, they're in another neighborhood, they're in another part of the country. They came into Jerusalem to, to do this religious activity, sacrifice on, the, on Passover, and Pilate killed them so that their blood mingled with the blood of their sacrifices, and those people must have been really bad sinners. And Jesus doesn't even go for it. He changes the topic. He changes the topic from, from them who died in a tragic accident to, to where these people are at right now who are bringing this event to Jesus' understanding. See, it's, it's awful, and, and, and you, can, you can lump two sufferings into two categories. There's human atrocities and there's natural accidents. See, this is a human atrocity. This is something that was deliberately done at the hands of a human being toward other human beings. Pilate had major issues with the Jews. Why? Because Pilate was a Roman official who was given jurisdiction of this area of, of, of land that the Romans had conquered, and now the Jews are living under this conquered Roman Empire, and they don't want to have anything to do with the Romans. But Pilate is there, and he's probably flexing his strength a little bit to show his power, and the Galileans were singled out because Galilee was notorious for raising up the most riotous group out of all the Jews. Maybe Pilate had heard of a coup that was about ready to take place, and so Pilate said, when they come to Jerusalem, guess what's going to happen to them? They're going to die. Whatever the situation was, men and women died at the hands of Pilate. And the Jews interpreted that killing as the way for them to go, those Galileans must have been really bad sinners. Because look at us, we're still alive. 
right? Look at us. Our lives are spared. So we must be in the right. We're prospering. We have life. They must have been in the wrong. They were sinners. They died. And Jesus doesn't go for it at all. (laughs) See, here's what Jesus does. He moves the focus of their amazement. They're amazed at this, this, this atrocity place. Jesus says, you shouldn't be amazed that that atrocity took place. What you should be amazed at is that you're still alive. Right? If the Galileans had only been more holy, Jesus, they could have avoided this grisly end. And Jesus says, your moral superiority, your moral goodness is not getting you anywhere. It is so easy to point at other people's misfortunes to sanctify your own soul. Isn't it? Isn't it easy to look at other people who are suffering and going through pain and being like, oh, I feel so sorry for them. I must be doing something right. And Jesus says, I will not answer abstract questions which will deflect from a personal confrontation you need to do right now with your own heart. See, Jesus is not playing games with people. Here's, here's one of the things that you can, you can either love and appreciate about Jesus or you can just totally not stand. And it's this, Jesus will never tell you what you want to hear. But he will always tell you what you need to hear. Can I get an amen from somebody over here? Yeah. Isn't it just like Jesus to once again confound us and confront us? See, they'd already drawn the false conclusion, right, that these Galileans were greater sinners than everybody else. But the false conclusion was based upon a false premise, and that's the way it always works out. Let me have you write down those words. Write down premise and write down conclusion. If you start with a bad premise, you will always end up with a bad conclusion. Premises are the places where that theology and that doctrine and the Bible reading comes in. And if you don't interpret it correctly, you're going to end up with a false conclusion. Right? Here's one of the classic ones out of, out of Scripture. I didn't give this the first service, so second service, you must be blessed today. Philippians chapter 4. And I know my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Right? There's the, there's the conclusion And so what we, though, miss out on is the premise in which it's built upon, and that's this, only those who live a godly and uh, and, and upright life before God can you rest assured on that promise. But we don't want the premise, we want the promise. We want the conclusion, but unless you know what the premise is, you're going to end up with the wrong conclusion, and you're going to get mad at God. Why? Why? Well, my athlete had that all tattooed to his eye and I'm going to claim that promise, right? That God's going to supply all my needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Yeah, it's not just a carte blanche blank check given to you. There, there's certain things you have to do in order to receive that promise. And so when we have faulty premises, you will end up with faulty conclusions, right? One suffering in life is not indi- indi- indicative of your sin, just like just as your prosperity is not proportional to your uh, piety. Say that 10 times fast. So here's what Jesus refuses to do. I'm not going to lump all tragedy to this, this pile of, well, everyone died because of their sin. And they deserved it, right? They had it coming to them. And, and let me just say too, and I think this is worthy to note, What I'm about to say is also for those of us who tend to be self-critical and self-condemning because we can look at, bless you, we can look at a a failed job, a failed marriage, failed parenting, and think to ourselves, I went through what I went through because of some sin in my life. And I think we need to ease up a bit. Not everything tragic that happens to us outside or within is due to personal sin. Sometimes things happen that are beyond our control. And so we're not going to nitpick our souls and look for every little unconfessed, unspoken sin in our lives. This is the amazing thing about God's mercy, right? Because here's the reality. Death happens. Tragedies happen. Sickness happens. The unthinkable happens to even the most godly and committed And not all tragedy or crisis is due to one's own sin. And so according to Jesus, here's the solution. Look, what does he say? So here's the situation, right? Man, those sinners, those Galileans, what a bummer for them. And what does Jesus say to these people bringing up this event? He says, 
what makes you think you're different? Repent and turn so that you may not perish like them. Write down that word, repent. And it's going to be a word, weird word to write down because we don't talk about repentance too often. We think of repentance as the crazy cuckoo for cuckoo puffs kind of guy on the corner with a sandwich board that says, repent, the end is near. Right? Repentance is, is for crazy, really overzealous Christian people. But you're going to find out something beautiful about repentance this morning. This is what I'm praying for God to, to speak to our hearts. Because according to Je Jesus, the, the solution to this problem of evil and pain and suffering and, and divine judgment, it's not to improve our behavior. God doesn't say what he says. He doesn't do what he does to, to change our behavior, but he does it so that we can come to a place of repentance. Notice what Jesus says. And in case you miss it, he mentions it twice. Verse three, verse five. Unless you repent. Notice what it doesn't say. Unless you go to church more. Unless you start tithing more. Unless you pray more. Unless you read the Bible more. Unless you your faith more. He doesn't list this litany of religious stuff. He basically says, there's one thing you need to do. Repent. What is repentance? It is a deep awareness where you make not only a volitional choice, but you make an intentional choice to turn from the person you used to be and to turn to the person God wants you to be. It's a mourning over who I was without God, and it's a celebration of who I now am in God. Repentance is not just a one-time event. It's a daily experience of the Christian that says, I must continually know who God is because unless I understand who God is, I will never understand who I am. And this is where God's mercy comes into play because God reveals himself and where holiness and sinfulness meet. Sometimes that's not a pretty occasion. But because of Jesus Christ being our mediator, he is the one that now allows us entrance before this holy, perfect, majestic God. So we can not only understand who he is, but now understand what his desires are for me as now his adopted son or daughter. See, repentance is a beautiful thing because it leads us to, to, to this, this, the, the problem, and the problem is we're all blind to God's glory, and we're all, we've all turned away from him, right? Romans chapter 3, for the wages of sin is death, right? All fall short of the glory of God. Chapter 3, chapter 5, for the wages of sin is death. And, and here's the problem. Everyone experiences, we live in a sinful world where all of us are going to face death. Matter of fact, three words, if you would. First word is sin. Second word is death. I know, isn't this the best conversation we're having right now? Yeah. Pastor, repent, sin, death, oh, no. Oh. Well, here's the, here's the third word, right? Sin, death, need. Here's what Jesus affirms. The universality of sin. Everyone born into this world is a sinner. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. It's part of our nature. Sin can only give birth to according to James chapter 1. So there's the universality of sin. There's the universality of death. But the third thing, and here's the mercy of God. There's the universality of need. We need a Savior. We need a Lord. We need a way out of our predicament. And here's the mysterious mercy of God at work. He rescues those who want to be rescued. Woo! Now, here's what I'm not saying. And here's the difficulty with this conversation. There's right questions and wrong questions in understanding God. Classic wrong question. Why doesn't God save everybody? Have you heard that before? Have you wrestled with that before? That's an honest question. Why does God choose to save some and not others? Wrong question. You want to know what the right question is? Why does God choose to save anybody? See, the first question implies entitlement. First question implies, I deserve this. 
and repentance has no entitlement in, in, in it. Repentance is, I lack everything. I need something. I am empty. I am poor. I am naked. I am wretched, right? And until, and Isaiah talks about this, right, in chapter 5. You come to me, those of you who are poor and wretched and naked, and you come and find food and, and clothes. See, ladies and gentlemen, the critical difference between those who are saved and those who are not saved is not about how relatively good they are. The difference is whether they've admitted that they are not good, whether they admitted they have seen God in, as supremely gracious, whether they have reversed the entire directions of their lives because of their lack of goodness and how gloriously supreme God is. That's the difference. This has nothing to do with behaviors. This has to do with a brokenness. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, and then they will see the kingdom of God. so good it is so good right whether we're talking about human atrocities next the next one is natural accidents so now jesus he introduced an event himself he's like now that we're on this topic let's talk about natural things that happen see the first category could be like 9 11 do you believe it's a 20 year anniversary this year 9 11 and that's a human atroc- atroc- atrocity right and weeks after that event people were flooding churches Right, because we're trying to make sense of this. This this was a localized atrocity happened on our soil. Horrible things took place. And I think while it took place in New York, we're we're feeling it here and people were wrestling with the question, why? Why God? Why God? Why would you allow this to take place? What about the tsunami that happened in Thailand? Tens of thousands of people, right? That's not a human atrocity. That was not, del- you know, there's, there's no human uh, agency behind that. Here's a natural disaster. So Jesus says, you guys hear about that. You know, we can talk about the Galileans. Let's talk about y- your friends. What about those 18 of your friends that were over there hiking along by the Tower of Siloam and it fell on them? 18 of your friends died under that tower. There's no human agency behind that. No one could sit there and go, I'm going to blame so-and-so or so-and-so. It happened. See, the thing is, Jesus is saying there are things that happen at the hands of evil people and there's things that happen because things happen. We live in a world that is not the way it was originally designed to be. Man fights against man, man fights against nature, man fights against animals, man fights against God. It's all around us. And and Jesus is highlighting something that we, we we can't miss out on. These things are tragic but also the thing you need to acknowledge too is this. These things are unexpected. No one knows when they're going to die. I wish my, my birth certificate had an expiration date on it. Okay. No one knows. The Galileans did not know they were going to die that day. The people walking by the Tower of Siloam did not know that tower was going to fall and, and kill 18 of them. So the shift Jesus brings is while you're saying they ask for it, I'm going to shift the conversation to why does this happen to anybody? Right? He, he teaches that there's, there's sin, there's death, and there's need. And Jesus wants us to understand one thing, and that's the word repentance. It is a reminder to us that things are not the way they should be. It is a reminder to us that things just don't happen by accident, things don't happen by chance, but things happen because sin is destructive. Sin is a parasite. It, is, it, it, it can't create, it can't renew, it can only destroy. And in the words of C.S. Lewis, pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God's saying, I'm here. And we just go, blah, 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 blah. What? Someone say something? <laughs> he, shout, he whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pain. See, Lewis wrote a book called The Problem of Pain. I recommend it. Put it on your list to read this year. 2021, Problem of Pain. 
classic Lewis where he talks about his own journey because he lectured on pain with, at a merely academic level without ha- having experienced pain in his own life. And then he walks through the valley of the shadow of death in his own personal life and he writes on pain from the perspective. See, pain invites us to come to Christ. Tragedy is an invitation for us to know God. Calamities, atrocities, suffering is a reminder that we cannot live our lives apart from God. Because it's easy to point out the misfortunes of others and think we're immune. To think we're excluded, right? The wrong right question. Wrong question is this. Why did these people die? That's the wrong question. The right question is this. What right do you have to live? You shouldn't be amazed that those people died at the hands of Pilate. You should be amazed that you're still alive and haven't died under his hands. You shouldn't be surprised that those people died under the Tower of Siloam. You should be amazed that you're still here and didn't die under that rubble. See, it's easier to talk about someone else's death and misfortune. It's a lot harder to think about your life and face up to your own sin and deal with your inevitable death. Can I break the news to you? And I'm sorry to have to break this to you. One day you're going to die. Can you be shocked? Can you be aghast right now? Can everyone go, no, you don't want to do that? Okay. One day you're going to die. Franklin was right. Two certainties in life, death and, speaking of, it's coming up. The wonder is not some people are allowed to suffer and, and, and others are suffering. is that we're still here. Here's what we need to get in the discipline of doing. Can I, can I give you a, a, it may seem like a strange exercise, but I'm gonna, I think it's going to help you understand what Jesus is getting at. The next time something tragic happens, no longer draw a line from the, from the event to the people. Next time suffering happens, draw from the own heart. I thank God I wasn't on that plane in Indonesia two days ago. I thank God I wasn't one of the five people that lost their lives in, in D.C. on Wednesday. How about this? I thank God I'm not in a hospital right now on a ventilator fighting for my life. You, you, you think the coronavirus is something like God's like, oh, I didn't have that on my, my day planner for 2020. Oh, I didn't, I didn't even factor this in. You shouldn't be, we should be praying for those that are, that are struggling with their health right now. But you also should be thanking God that you're not there and that you have a chance to make peace with him because you could get it and you could die from it. But the question is not whether you get it or not or whether you survive it or not. The question is, do you know God today? Wow. See, it's my observation, you guys, that we are most embarrassed about our sin, the areas in which we're most ashamed, the areas that we, have, we deal with this sin inside. Rather than dealing with those things with repentance, we deal with it in denial. Denial is ignoring what God is trying to reveal to you about yourself. Mind you, things he already knows about you. Repentance is the opportunity for you to come clean. Acknowledge your sinfulness before his holiness and to turn from what has held you in bondage and to allow you to live a life of liberty and freedom. That's what repentance is. And that's a continual journey. And I'm going to make, I'm going to make a bold statement right here. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm, I'll go to the grave believing this. This is how bold it is. Repentance is the gauge of how real your faith is before God. You hear what I'm saying? Repentance is the gauge. It's, it's not your spiritual disciplines. It's not your spiritual activities. It's not your Bible reading, your praying, your church attendance, your giving, whatever. Those are all wonderful things. But the very thing that God looks for the most is the very thing we talk about the least. Repentance. It is the gauge of the reality of your faith. Now, some of you are going, that's a pretty remarkable statement. 
I'm going to back it up with scripture. Can, can I do that? You're like, I don't believe you, pastor. Okay, fine. Will you believe the word of God? Chapter three, verse eight. In keeping with repentance. Stop right there. No words. God has designed us to bear fruit. But you cannot bear fruit, which is really a symbolic way of saying, be godly, grow in godliness, grow in righteousness, if you're not keeping up with repentance. See, the problem is we're experiencing a lot of shallowness in our spiritual lives. Maybe some of us are going through some desert seasons, some dry moments spiritually. Have you ever felt like my spiritual life has grown cold or it's a little lack, lacking something? Here's what I'm going to tell you right now. More often than not, the issue is repentance. Are you knowing your God? Are you chasing your God? Are you understanding the character of your God? Are you looking at the attributes of, of your God? Are you allowing his holiness to show up in your sinfulness so that you hear his voice say, turn to me, come back to me. I want to love you. I want to restore you. I want to, to, to not only have you be broken because God doesn't just leave us broken, but he breaks us to heal us. And this is what happens in repentance. I will tell you there's no bearing fruit if there's no repentance. I read a marriage book the other day and, and, I, and I think this doesn't just pertain to marriage. This, re, this pertains to to the totality of our lives. But in this book, it had to do with marriage. And the, the writer made this statement, and I, and I totally agree with it. Um, when marriage difficulties happen, it's not that me, um, husband and wife fall out of love with each other, it's that they fall out of repentance. <laughs> about this. I can tell you in, in, in 30, years of, 30 years of ministry, I feel old. I, I just saying that, I'm like, am I that old? Almost 30 years of ministry, I've, as I've met and I've mentored and I've coached and I've counseled couples and those who are engaged and those who are dating and, and just men and women in general, you never fall out of love with God. You never fall out of love with your spouse. You never fall out of love with your children. The issues that happen in our lives is because we stop repenting in our own hearts. Because here's what the devil does. He begins to feed you these lies of self-justification and the, the strongest instrument of your body becomes your fear. Who's at fault? And I've met couple after couple after couple. And the issue is always them. And then been frequently reminded of me that when there's one finger pointing at somebody else, there's always three pointing right back at you. Amen. Why did God design us like this? And the couples that I have seen flourish are the ones who have a deep recognition of their own sin and guilt and shame. But the couples that don't make it are always the ones thinking, I'm good, it's them. Repentance is the gauge of the reality of your faith. And it is the gauge of how healthy your relationships are with God and with other people. Here's the beauty of what we're talking about here. Is that when God reveals to us how far we fall short in our sin and, and, and that sense of shame and guilt, he is always ready to forgive. This is the good news. This is the gospel. This is, this is the mercy. Is that when God shows us the most, most horrible aspects of who we are as people, he's always ready to follow it up with, and you're not stuck there. Woohoo! He forgives. He restores. He renews. He recreates. He makes us better than we were the day before. As long as we don't deny but repent. As long as we're willing to own up. And, what, and, and guess what? Here's what's remarkable about Paul's statement, right? His strength is made perfect in our weakness. This is where the treasure of the gospel is showcased in jars of clay. Whew. 
the really amazing thing, you guys, is that this universe, in this universe is that guilty sinners perish, but that God is so slow to anger that you and I can sit here this morning and have one more chance to repent and get right with him. Is that good news? Repentance is good. And this is why God, Jesus, follows it up with a parable. And we're going we're gonna to close with this. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think it just puts, this is like the cherry on top. He tells a story, a parable. And I'm going to tell you, this is about God's patience. Understanding our significance. Here's what I love. Is that you and I are different than any other part of God's creation. We sang that this morning in that song, So Will I. Isn't that cool? You know, the, the cosmos, the oceans, the trees, the, the manatees, my personal favorite. If anyone ever finds, I mean, I got baboons today, but if you ever find a manatee, sure, I'll pay you double for it, all right? creation the baboons are not wrestling in their little groups over pride and suffering and making sense of god they're living their lives we feel it differently than any part of creation why because we're created in his image unlike any other parts of creation we are rational we are relational we are moral we are ethical we are spiritual creatures that's not like any other creation we're unique But because we're unique, there's a special significance we have in our lives, and that's this. God wants you to live for him and with him. That's why you've been created. You've been created for no other purpose than to to worship him and walk with him. The problem is when he plants trees, which are symbolic of human beings, and we don't bear fruit according to what the vineyard owner is looking for. Now make this connection because Jesus is making this connection for us. He's saying when you repent, you get to reflect in your lives all that God has created you to be. When you come to the place of forgiveness with Christ, you can experience this change of attitude, change of behavior, but change of attitude and change of behavior doesn't happen before there's a change of heart. Belief impacts behavior. Brokenness impacts effectiveness. So what happens? So the vineyard owner comes out to his vineyard and sees the fig trees. Fig trees are always symbolic of God's people in the Bible. The figs, the fruit, is always symbolic of godly living. So the fig tree owner, the person who's responsible for planting it, comes out and says, I planted this thing three years ago. I spent a lot of time on this. I have trees in my own yard personally. On the side of my house, I have a blood orange tree and a tangerine tree, and I've had those trees for 15 years, and they have yet to produce fruit. You would think, like, I cut these things down, right? But I still water them, because at least they're, bare, they're, they're shady. But there's no fruit. I would have the right, as the owner of those trees, to go, you know what, I'm digging them up, and I'm going to put something more, more fruitful there. See, there's a time of evaluation That happens where the vineyard owner has the right to look at his property and go, I am the one who owns this tree. It is ineffective. It is worthless. It is useless. It is fruitless. Therefore, I'm going to yank it up and put something there that's going to bear fruit. But then the caretaker comes in and says, whoa, 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 hold on. Could could you give me a year? Because I'm going to dig some fresh trenches and I'm going to throw some fresh manure and some fresh fertilizer in there. And could you give me a year? And if after a year it doesn't bear fruit, go ahead and cut it down. See, you have the owner logic of righteousness. You have the caretaker uh, logic of mercy. See, there's a time of evaluation and God is asking us today. Are you bearing fruit with keeping in with repentance because if not there's a second time and it's called the time of execution all fruitless trees will be uprooted and cast into the fire john chapter 15 if there's any branch that does not bear fruit guess what happens it's cut off and it's destroyed praise god for his patience that he's given us another opportunity to say, I'm no longer going to live for me and my kingdom. I'm going to live for you and your kingdom, God. 
I am broken over my sin. I am broken over the ways I've lived my life. I've broken over the ways I thought it was my will and not your will. Restore me. Let me turn 180 degrees from the person I used to be to the person I now can be in Christ. Because I'm understanding that the evaluation is happening. God's saying, how, how, how are you bearing fruit? Do you know him? Have you repented? Because you could go by the Tower of Siloam today on the way home and it could crush you. Are, you. are you ready? You could die at the hands of some political extremist. Are you ready? It could have been me on the plane. It could have been you on the mountain. But we're here. And Jesus says, repent today or you will likewise perish. See, the issue isn't that you're going to die. Are you going to die a death that's going to lead to everlasting life? Or are you going to die a death that's going to lead to everlasting death? Because the execution is going to happen. The vineyard owner has every right to pull up unfruitful, worthless trees, doesn't he? Praise God, today is the day of salvation. Let me close back to D.C. One of the guys arrested for violent protest was a CEO of a big tech company in Chicago. Did you hear about this guy? 52 years of age, successful. Ends up going to D.C., gets wrapped up in the violent protesting. Right? I have nothing against peaceful protesting. I have an issue when you start tearing up and terrorizing things. He gets arrested. Here's his statement. It is the worst personal decision I ever made in my life. While it may be bad, can I tell you it's not the worst? You know what the worst possible decision you'll make in your life is? Living without Jesus. You know why 2021 is going to be a phenomenal year? Because we are going to be a community, a family of people who are going to chase Jesus recklessly because we want God to be glorified above everything else. Amen, church? We are going to be a people who go, we want to bear fruit. As we live understanding and accepting one another in our brokenness and everything, we're going to live encouraging one another towards godliness and righteousness. Why? Because we are going to be accountable to him. Let's stop living for ourselves. Let's live for the kingdom. And all God's people said, woo, let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for <laughs> just a couple aspects of your, your character that you've revealed to us once again, your mercy and your patience. And, and while we can talk about your mercy and your patience, we can talk about a whole heck of a lot of aspects of who you are. We can talk about your grace. We can talk about your kindness. We can talk about your long suffering. We can talk about your compassion. Lord, you are a God that we will never plummet the depths of. You're a God who has revealed so much of who you are to us. Lord, it is going to take eternity for us to even know you deeply. But Lord, while we continue to desire to know you deeply, may we continue to understand how you care for us deeply. You've given us today as a wonderful reminder of your mercy, of your patience. Today, you're a God who says to each and every one of us here, it's not too late to turn the car around. It's, it's not too late to, to, to stop doing what we've been doing because what we've been doing sometimes has been empty. Lord, today you allow us to turn our lives around to repent from thinking that we were on the throne and to turn to you who are truly on the throne. Lord, help us to live for your glory and your majesty, for your kingdom, your will. Whatever is said and done, may it be for you. May we lift up and exalt our Lord and Savior, so that not only are we compelled to come to Him continually, but that others would be drawn to Him. Lord, thank You again for Your patience today. And thank You for Your mercy that has been met 
in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We are nothing without Jesus. Thank you for his sinless, perfect sacrifice for us. Because you so love the world that whoever believes in Christ Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting life. And we can only pray this in His name. May the Lord continue to lift His face toward you, give you His grace and mercy forever and ever. Amen. Love you, church. Appreciate you. We will be meeting in about 20 minutes right back here for those that want to stay for Vision 2021. And for the rest of you, have an awesome, awesome day. Godspeed, friends.